Ladies and gentlemen, our first guest today is none other than my good friend, starting with a smile and a laugh, as always, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> give it up for Morpheus Titania. You hey, might know him as Thomas Costanzo. Tom, welcome to the show, brother. Oh, it's good to be here, Adam. How you doing? <laughs> Excellent. Where are you coming to from today? I'm in Mesa, in my apartment. Mesa. So yeah. I, 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 we got to give we got to give everybody the background on your case and and what you're we're gonna, we're gonna like I, I don't know how much <laughs> we're gonna be allowed to get into today, but it's always fun. But I have to really introduce you properly because okay, Tom Costanzo, Morph no, just Morpheus, Morpheus, yeah. came to me and helped pull me out of the matrix. Uh, when I was early on uh, in my activism career as a Ron Paul supporter, he at, at that point, he was already a seasoned activist. In, and, and for those of you who don't know, Mesa, Arizona is part of the bigger Phoenix metro area. Uh, with Freedoms Phoenix, with Ernie Hancock, that's how I met him when Ernie was supporting me running for Congress as a, as a Ron Paul endorsed <coughs> Republican in, in 2010. Um <laughs> Hey, 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 motherfucker, don't laugh. Don't laugh. Oh, yeah. I mean, I used to be a Republican, but I'm better now, okay? Just I like you wouldn't know. laugh at someone for, for, you know, for being bipolar or delusional or a compulsive liar <laughs> or a kleptomaniac <laughs> or a statist or authoritarian or subservient personality disorder. You support them in overcoming their mental health challenges. Okay, so right. Tom, <laughs> Tom is, is really... I, I think under like I, people have called me like an, an underground hero. Uh, yeah, of course, I'm going to introduce him by talking to myself. You'll see, talk about myself. You'll see where this is going. But people have described me as an underground hero for being, you know, a, a, a lesser public figure, for being well known for civil disobedience, for being a, a legitimate hero to people who, who share our values of freedom and nonviolence uh, and, and standing up to authority for my civil disobedience. But Tom has me beat for being both underground and being a hero or, or heroic, I should say. He is, he is I mean, I, I, think, I think he has an unhelpful built-in humility that keeps him avoiding the spotlight because he really should be grabbing it right now for what he's doing and his legal situation and what it means for America and the world and the future of humanity. Don't worry, I'll explain that, and I promise I'll give him some time to talk today when I'm done introducing this legend. So I saw him in court. I mean, he has he has been he has been around with the Freedoms Phoenix crew doing civil disobedience for I don't, I don't even know how long. But when I went to his court hearing two years ago in Phoenix at the federal courthouse, and by the way, that is it's like three dumb, years ago. Was it three, oh my gosh, it was three years ago. Yeah, now. It was 2017. Well, yeah, they time, got me on flies 20. time flies when you're not in jail. I mean, for you, I'm sure you're counting the days, and especially with being oh, still I do. on paper. <laughs> okay, oh, was, so this was, is. And you know what's funny? Here's the funny thing it was 911 days I did. Oh, geez. Okay, hold on. Is we got a weird story. I'm transitioning to that, Tom. Give me just no, one no, more. No, I just, but when you said days, it was it's 911 days. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, during which time he became an even more enlightened guru. I, I'm going to let him explain to how he spent his time in jail. But uh, it, the the headline I, I have for this story from uh, from C C N Arizona Bitcoin trader sentenced to 41 months in prison for money laundering. An Arizona man with a particularly lengthy rap sheet that includes guns, ammo, and drugs has been sentenced to prison for laundering drug money with Bitcoin. And I remember sitting in court that day three years ago when the prosecutor introduced you almost as well as I'm introducing you now by reading your rap sheet. And it took a full 10 minutes for him to get through it. And, I, and it was like driving without a license, a unregistered vehicle, theft for, for, for this, guns, drugs, ammo, and, 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 and all victimless crimes, the theft thing, whatever it was. It was, it was obviously some a bullshit, you know, Trump. I don't even remember if they used that, that term. But it, I mean, the rap sheet was like, yeah, it took, 
And and Ernie is sitting next to me in court and goes, yeah, duh, he's been an activist for decades. What do you expect? And it's like, yeah, he's that kind of activist. So Morpheus, with, with all of that, I mean, I don't know if you want to comment on that intro, but I think our guests, or excuse me, our, our audience is, is most uh, interested in hearing about your legal situation and the, this this most recent major episode of your activism. But hey, man, stage is yours. Okay, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, it's great to be here, and uh, I always enjoy chatting with you. You know, it's we're, we've been good friends, great friends for such a long time now. And I remember first, you know, when we first built your signs. You know, we we were coming up with the design, and we're like, okay, what can we? How what can we? What kind of flavor flavor can we put on this? So we the said, so, the okay, the parodies of 2010. Yeah, <laughs> enjoy Kokesh, and then we, you know, we we use the font for the Coca Cola, and and then we came out to to New Mexico and hung out with you. Our first time I got to meet Jordan Page there. Yeah, and remember, kids, this is, this was ten years ago before those kind of yeah. soda visual parodies were played out. Okay, we were still clever and original back then. Yeah, we were we were we were like cutting cutting new ground, basically, is what we were doing. And we put up those signs all over new, all over Santa Fe, and and we got a chance to hang out and you know just get a chance to know each other, and it was you know you know the bromance started, you know. <laughs> and, and 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 then before, even most recently, before going to jail, you were up here in Gardenia helping clear the fence line. Yeah, yeah, that was Chainsaw. only a few months before. Yeah, All right, was, so and you know what's re what's really interesting? One of the things that's really interesting is I don't know. I probably told you the story, but when I was up at your house, I was sleeping by the fire. And it was cold, and I got up to put a a, a a a big log on top of the fire, and so I got up, and then while I'm walking back with this big log in my hands, I trip over a rock, and I land right on my throat landed right on where the, the rim was for the, for the fire pit. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I could have died that day, that night. I mean, if I had you know, crushed my larynx, I mean, I could have died and no one might've even heard me. I mean, it was, it was really a trippy situation for me. So I'm very grateful I, you know, I didn't die. And, and I, I was, you know, it was fun, you know, meeting you up at your place and hanging out and, and just trading crypto, which you know has been my passion for many years, and it's really I think we're really moving into the future now because as as we keep on moving forward, I was just talking to someone here in town about uh, these the way of wrapping wrapping coins and being able to put them on a Ethereum network, and then you can buy into both sides for liquidity, and now we can have exchanges that aren't you don't have to have KYC for. And now once this, once this takes over, they're going to have a really hard time with things because that's how they, they trap us into this KYC stuff. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. We got to, we got to back way up. Like how did you first get into crypto? Why did you find it so compelling? And how did that lead you to the situation you were in when you got set up? I don't know, three, four years, I guess it was four years ago when they started setting you up, right? Yeah, uh, doing, over, yeah. Uh, trading out with local Bitcoin. Well, I was going to this, I, I, I was going to this meeting called the Republic for the Arizona. It was like a bootstrap of, we're going to reboot the Republic because everything after when the Congress walked out of, out of uh, when, the, when the Congress walked out and they didn't have enough, <clears throat> excuse me, enough, congressman to form a quorum to have a, a set a new date basically since that time everything that the congress has done has been illegal and fraudulent because lincoln actually forced them to have congress i forget the date i'm a little rusty on a lot of this stuff now but they they were the congress walked out and they didn't have a before they were able to reestablish a new date for them to reconvene they walked out. So they had no, no way of having a quorum and they couldn't establish a new date for them to come back together. So Lincoln actually forced the, the Congress back into session against his power, which is basically, you know, it's all about the power. 
And so then since basically since that point in time, everything that they've done is completely fraudulent. And so this was an attempt to reboot the Republic. And it wasn't, it was, it was growing at one point, but then they arrested Tim Turner, who was the, the president of the, of the Republic. And then it all kind of seemed to be imploding. And a friend of mine, Brad, he gave a pre at the one of the tail ends of these meetings, gave a presentation on Bitcoin. And, um, and he gave, you know, he spoke about it, basically talked about how at that point, I think it was like six dollars and how it had ramped up and how it's this increasing scarcity in the future model. And he talked about the encryption. He was a programmer, you know, geek type guy. He was geeking out over it. And I, I saw that and I go, I know exactly what I need to do. I need to get some of them Bitcoins. And, okay, so now I, well, actually at that time, I, he had me writing down, we're going down the road of going for the mining aspect. Well, at the time I didn't have, I had like $600 to my name and I couldn't buy a computer that would, or a mining rig that would be sufficient to mine because you needed, I just cut it nine ways from Sunday and I couldn't find the, the right equipment in the price range that I wanted to, that I needed in order to mine Bitcoin. And at that time, that's when the, the AS, uh, ask the ASCII, not ASCII, um, you know, the higher performance computers to get the um, ASICs with ASICs yeah. had come out. And the, so they were just transitioning to that at that point in time. And I didn't certainly didn't have enough money for an ASIC. And they, of course, they were taking people's money, but they weren't shipping them anyway. So I'm going, OK, what can I do here? OK, I need to buy some of them Bitcoins and then I'll do what I do anyway, which is sell stuff. I mean, that's that's what I do. I I love sales. Uh, I've used it for years when. Like when we would be making DVDs, you remember all the DVD players, uh, you know, the DVD uh, machines that Ernie bought and we'd be making all these Alex Jones DVDs, the seven pack and had like seven videos, oh, yeah. all kinds of DVDs to pass out and everybody else would be giving them away. And I'm like, the hell with that. This costs money. I'm going to, you're going to, Hey, if I make you pay for it, then you're going to more likely to watch it anyway. And then we'll have resources to be able to buy more resources. And then also I'll be able to keep some of this for myself. So I, I, I made it my mission to like be able to be an activist and make money with it instead of, you know, and I wasn't using the traditional routes like uh, some people do where they use the, uh, you know, use YouTube and get advertising dollars from, from, from YouTube. That's so, a myth. That doesn't happen. What? <laughs> oh, you're not no, getting no, any, just, any. We did, we did our whole episode yesterday about this. Um, that originally I was getting three dollars per thousand views, two million views a month, six million or six thousand dollars a month, very comfortable compensation. And now my rate per view uh, per thousand views is eight cents. Wow, went from three dollars oh. to eight cents. So it's 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 only only if you're it, but just so you know, Morpheus, with with this interview, you know, we're going to post this as a video on YouTube. I see a lot of mm -hmm. lot of you were locked up. Uh, yeah, YouTube really. I know. I mean, got got even more corrupt and and I mean, prop problematic as as they would say. And so now, I mean, I might as well say, fuck pedophilia, coronavirus. And now uh, we have to check all these boxes on YouTube that get us taken out of the promotion algorithm and demonetize. So are you demonetized because of who you are or because that's their new overall uh, payment plan? Yeah, that, that's kind of the mystery, you know, and, and I'm going to take this to turn it back to your case here, because as, as activists and, and as libertarians, um, you know, to people who don't know the dangers that we are aware of, we seem paranoid, right? And, and and it is easy when you realize how much government is out to get you, uh, even if just as a tax cow, that, uh, you know, to, to be that, you know, to, to get over-concerned about certain things. And I don't know, are, are they targeting me personally? Or is it just, oh, well, let's set up a general policy. I mean, it's sort of like, is the police state racist, right? Well, you look at the numbers and you go, 
Well, fuck yeah, it is. Oh yeah, there's there's a lot of racism in the legal system. The no, you can't deny there's racism one way or another. There's but you look at it on paper. Is there racism? No, of course not. On paper, it's black and white. It's all objective. It just you know allows for the expression of that racism. So is it is it you know. I, I think if, if I had to guess, and I, and, I, and I think I can conclusively say that the majority of, you know, censorship in these kinds of challenges that you and I face are just, well, let's go after, you know, everybody in this category because it serves our agenda. So in your case, you were selling Bitcoins and, and buying Bitcoins on, on localbitcoins.com. And it's just a, a website where people can can look up reputable traders and uh, you know, you could, you could say, hey, I'm in Phoenix area and I want to meet someone. I want to give somebody $100 cash so I can buy Bitcoin anonymously, zap it onto my device, and, and then I can use it and spend it anonymously. And you were set up by federal agents. I, I mean, maybe first you have to answer, you know, are you able to talk about all of this now? Oh, yeah. But you yeah. were set up. Okay, great. About it. So you were, I mean, you were set up by a multi-agency federal task force that raided your apartment. And when they raided right. your apartment, there were four different agencies represented. Right? No, it was more than that. Legal, like it law was a bunch. For the raid, I mean, it was it was Maricopa County. It was city police. It was two different federal agencies, at least, as yeah. I recall. And the, the, the big question is, um, by the way, I love how this, this the, the Yahoo story has you described as uh, raided the local Bitcoin trader and anarchist blogger and was retained in custody until his trial following a hearing after being classified as a serious flight risk i mean you were <laughs> obviously railroaded there but do you think that they really came after you personally or this is part of like the and obviously they were and they picked you to pursue as a case but did why did they pick you was it something special about you or was it let's go after people trading bitcoin well I made some critical errors in my <clears throat> judgment, and I like to take, you know, uh, personal responsibility for the things that happen in my life. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a victim, and we do pick our, you know, what the decisions that we make determine what our life is going to be like. And so I take responsibility for my actions, and one of the things that they gravitated to... and. Uh, to me is because on local bitcoins, I said, I do $50,000 or more. And actually I was doing more than that. And, but, but advertising that I was doing $50,000 or more, they zoomed in on that. And, you know, with the internet, I, I did my best to kind of keep myself pseudo anonymous. Uh, and that was the whole, that's one of the things that I love about, about crypto is that, you can be anonymous in this thing we're in. And, and, and privacy is something I value very deeply more than what most people I think do value their privacy. And so I, I wanted to keep myself as anonymous as possible, but of course there's little breadcrumbs that I would leave. And I think when they, you know, they did their research and figured out who I was, because I mean, once you have their phone number, unless you have it, in a multi, you know, like in a corporation or something like that, it's really hard to, you know, you can Google somebody's phone number and go, oh yeah, that's Thomas and bam, there you know who it is. And of course they have all the databases that we don't have. You know, it's like if you go to a, uh, a private investigator, you give them somebody their social security number, they can find out pretty much everything they want about you. Well, they have these databases that we are, don't have access to. And so I think when they put my name in there and then they found, they saw all this, the stuff that I do, then they went jackpot. And so it wasn't like they targeted me, but when they found out, because I was going through a lot of my papers, one of my friends here in town, he was kind enough to store all my, you know, most of my stuff in, you know, for me so that when I got out, I'd have my, my stuff, which you know, wasn't really a lot, amount, a lot of it didn't amount to much, but, you know, some of those things, you know, you keepsake things that, oh, it's nice to have it. Like this t-shirt I'm wearing, you know, I, I was able to get that back from my girlfriend at the time, uh, Mary, she, she kept a lot of my clothes and, you know, I was, it's just, it's, I feel very blessed 
that I had so many good friends. But when they found out who I was, when I went through, when I was going through all this paper, when I was going through this stuff at my buddy's house, I, I went through, I was finding all these paper, all this paperwork of shit that I filed against these people. I mean, I filed, you know, they give me a ticket and I'd file, you know, the, the, the riot act against these people as like, you don't own me. You don't seem to comprehend this, this, this thing is that you do not own me. And just because you put me in this contract and I have the social responsibility to perform how you dictate doesn't mean I agree with that. And I must agree in order to be in contract with you as long as I don't hurt anybody. And so I found all this paperwork and I'm going, oh, I see why they went after me. It's quite obvious. It's like they, 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 they literally found the best possible person to go after. And right. In that sense, right. Well, in that sense, you're, you're the perfect victim. And I, I really right. want to go back to this. Like, why? Like, let's not let's not flip this around. Uh, you know, I, I kind of feel like you're betraying your your core voluntarist libertarian values by saying I'm not a victim. You know, no, let's uh, let's call the criminals what they are. They chose you as a victim, like a bully sure. chooses a victim because you were an easy target. And it's why they were able to deny you bail and bond, calling you a flight risk, which was absurd. You know, that you well, that's how it is in the federal system. The federal system, it's almost impossible to get bond. I mean, okay, literally. Sir, but the way, the, fair enough. But the, it, maybe that's not an exception to the case here. But mm -hmm. the, the, the raid, even, you know, it, it's so much direct persecution of you. For you to say, I'm not a victim, that's like a rape victim saying, I'm not a victim because I wore a short skirt. No, fuck that. You might, well, you know, you I, need to take responsibility for taking risks. If you're an attractive young woman walking down a dark alley, almost naked in the middle of the night, yeah, you're. I don't want to say asking for it because that's really terrible verbiage for what I'm saying here. But you, you are putting yourself in a riskier position. That does not make you not a victim. When you get victimized, and you are the victim here, Tom, am I wrong? I hear you. I hear you, but I, I'm, I'm going to use an analogy. Just And I hear what you're saying, but I'm, I'm accepting my part. Right. Of you're, you're, my... You're, you're taking responsibility for the risks that you took. That does right. not mean that you're not a victim. And, and I, I well, think I, that, am, that, I am a victim. I, I agree with you, but I'm not. But at the same time, I do not. I'm not adopting the attitude of being a victim. I, and I oh, love okay. that. Absolutely, you say I'm not a victim, even though I was the victim in this case. That's that's a right, very important because, thing. I want to make because, sure our audience gets that. Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of important. But and I I, I I I do recognize the errors of my judgment that put me in the position to be victimized. You took more risk than you meant to. Meant than was wise to. Okay, fair enough, right? Not, not like it was actually accidental. But let's get into this now specifically. What were the charges and, and why did they set you up with these specific ones? Well, they gave me four counts of money laundering because in each case, the undercover agent came and said, okay, this money comes from drugs. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm not in the drug business. I mean, realistically, yeah, see that, that, that that was a mistake, right? That you actually right. That was an error of my judgment where, because right, right, right. Hold on, I want, I want to put this out because we called this after your case the Costanzo rule, mm -hmm. right? Is that you have to make you have to disconnect. This is this is the lesson for the crypto community. Is that if you are out doing anything with crypto and you hear someone explicitly say. I am going to do something illegal with this money. You have to cut them off because there's a decent chance that they're a Fed trying to set you up. And it's no, oh, it's more than but a decent friend, chance. Our right, our friend Morgan in in California got set up with this even worse. He was in well, he was actually in Nevada doing a Bitcoin deal, and the person purchasing the Bitcoin or selling Bitcoin to to get cash said, "I'm going to use this money." To, to buy what in California was 
legal cannabis processing equipment to make extracts. And the Fed okay. said, well, that's federally illegal. And you said it was OK. So you knowingly contributed to illegal activity. Right. Now, money laundering, blah, blah. And he did serious time, too. OK. Yeah. See, that's they, they, they use the law because these people, they go, you know, they have, of course, they have millions of laws. And basically, all they got to do is pick you out and say, hmm, what law did you break? And then just figure out which law you broke or put you in a position to break the law, which is what they did with me. Now, I actually did pretty good uh, in terms of the judge liked me. I mean, he really gave me some pretty good compliments at, the, at the, my sentencing. But I met a guy when I was in Safford. They did the same thing to him, only they did it with an airplane. They said, oh, we want to buy this airplane from you. We're going to use it to, to, sell, to uh, smuggle drugs. And he's like, give me the money. I'll give you the airplane. I'm not party to this situation. Well, two years later... They came and knocked on his door and said, oh, we're arresting you. We're going to give you 20 freaking years. 20 years. And, and this and guy told may, me he never even had a parking ticket. Yeah, so Tom, if I may just interject, you know, one more important point as a takeaway for the audience on this. This is the, this is the depth of how scary it is to live in the modern American police state. And let's acknowledge that and take appropriate precautions. And what I mean is that anytime someone mentions illegal activity, like even me, like I'm, I'm, do, I'm gonna do it right now and, and they can't arrest, uh, Tom knows that if I tell him on the air, Tom, guess what? I smoke cannabis in Arizona legally under Arizona law and illegally under federal law. Like there's no interaction. I'm not buying anything from him or selling anything. There's no money. Right, but that answer. alone. Exa that alone creates a liability for any exchange or relationship related to that conversation. And we right. have to take things that seriously. And, and, and I know with the libertarian community, especially with the Adam versus the man and civil disobedience libertarian community, we're, we're very cavalier. And right. I love that. And we should be, but at the same time, respect how cavalier it is that we are being because of the serious threat with which we are being cavalier and know that right. even mentioning illegal activity can have 20 years of consequences. Right. Right. So, and, and like I said, I do better. I, uh, you know, and, and all I would have had to do, you know, like almost everyone else that I was locked up with, they actually did something. All I had to do was not do something. When I went to the meeting, the guy says, oh yeah, this money comes from drugs. I could have said, well, thank you very much. Have a nice day. I'll see you later. I walked away. That's so I, I take responsibility for not doing that. For walking and, into and the that, trap. Right. Yeah. I, I knew better. But the thing is, is my greed and my enthusiasm for Bitcoin <laughs> took over the mental process. And, and but to see, this is what they train for. They train for this. They go to classes to understand how to manipulate people Crap. into doing things that you know but like there were other these other cases where they actually went out they found homeless people and they said oh there's drugs in this house if you help us rob the house we will pay you and then they bought their friends and then because they brought guns now they were they were part of it they were entrapped but because they have certain rules that they go to class for and learn to understand and and how to when it goes into a court situation they're not going to get screwed over because they didn't follow the rules which you didn't get a chance to go to those classes and they don't have them in grade school or, or high school or any of those other you know of mandatory youth indoctrination camps that we have to go to then they're able to they have knowledge that that you don't have and and they study for this and so I, I, I've been to numerous conferences on Bitcoin. I've never seen a, a federal uh, agent get up on the thing and say, here, if you want to stay legal, don't do this, 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 and this. I've never seen it. Well, why is that? Because they don't want people to be educated. Because as long as you're dumb, then we can, we can cycle you through the system and you, they can get what they want, which is money, power, and control. Yep. But I, yep. I'm not angry at them. And that's, I think, one of the biggest takeaways 
of my experience is that I used to be incredibly, insanely angry at these people for what they do. And, and now I just realize it's just part of this whole, of the whole system is just part of being in samsara, which is this endless cycle of birth, suffering, death, and rebirth. I mean, it's been going on, the Buddhists say, for trillions and trillions of trillions of eons. That's what they say. Now, I don't know if that's true, but it seems that uh, that whole process, it's, it's, it ha- it, you know, if you go from the dawn of civilization, that's what humanity has been like. Birth, sur- suffering, death, and rebirth. Tom, you are my favorite human <clears throat> embodiment of the best quote ever from John Lennon, who said, when it gets down to having to use violence, then you are playing the system's game. The establishment will irritate you. Pull your beard, flick your face to make your fight, to make you fight. Because right. once they've got you violent, then they know how to handle you. Right, the with more violence. They don't know how to handle is nonviolence and humor. Right. So, so- I I I don't know if you want to comment on that and and what the big spiritual awareness intersection is with Bitcoin, but I I hope you can also share with our audience the significance of your case for the Bitcoin community. And and also, what is is your current status? Are are you on just probation, house arrest? You were on a a, a really weird transition from incarceration thing that's like only in Arizona from fully incarcerated to... Uh, semi house arrest, a halfway or a halfway home, right? You're in a, you're yeah, halfway home feds. status, it's not but Arizona. Then in a friend's house. Oh, I know. It's well, I haven't seen one quite. I'm sure there are other states. You're right, but I, I haven't seen one quite as complex as as what you were dealing with. Well, I think it's it's all part of the federal system. It's that's that's how they operate, and basically, if you get out once you get out of the feds, you go. <laughs> into a halfway house and then once you get out of the halfway house then you go into the home confinement situation um where you have to every it's like you have to fill out a a a, um, travel sheet anywhere you go and like when you're at the halfway house you have to be there at certain times you can't leave i mean it's almost like i used to tell people i'm in prison i just can't leave i got a cell phone I'm, i'm in my own clothes that's, yeah, <laughs> that, so, that seemed a little unusual. <laughs> yeah, and then once I graduated out of that, then you go into the probation. Now, federal probation, i am been pretty happy with. It's, it's really easy. I haven't had hardly any interaction with my PO, which is nice. I mean, at one point in time, I got off, went to the pro, went from the, the, the uh, halfway house to the probation. And I took a couple PP tests and then I didn't hear from him for about two months. I'm like, should I call this guy and just say, hey, is everything OK? And then I decided, nah, I'll just wait for him to call me. He knows where I'm at. And if he wants to get a hold of me, he will. But I mean, it was like it was so devoid of any communication. I was like, is everything OK? at your end? <laughs> so so eventually he did contact me. Just, hey, how you doing? Everything's going. I, maybe it's because of coronavirus. I don't know. And it's just everything's been super cool. You know, as far as that goes, I, I'm just limited. In, you know, basically, I'm, I'm not allowed to drink, but I don't drink. So that doesn't affect me. Uh, and we did. I think we did get a small, tiny little microscopic win at the appeal because uh, they said, oh, well, you can have alcohol, you just can't consume it. <laughs> okay. You know, like if uh, your girlfriend comes over or something. But the really oh, bad, pro- the really, one of the, the worst situation, the worst, biggest challenges, I mean, is, you know, especially for me, is when you're on federal probate, once you get out of the federal system, if there's ever a situation where I can, they have this thing, called um kind of it's with a firearm 
uh, I forget the word now, but if you, if I'm in the presence of a firearm and it's not in a holster on somebody else's hip, then I they can actually charge me with oh, a constructive use of a firearm, which they can give you 10 years on. I met a guy in. Hold on, they in, never explained when I, when I got my felony and DC police explained it to me, it was just, you can't be in possession. There was none of this in the vicinity, uncontained wow. or holstered. It was just, if you're, so, I mean, like, I, as far as I know, I'm allowed to touch a gun. I just can't be in possession of it, like physical control. Well, right. There, but the thing is, like, I met a guy. He was, he got in a fight with his girlfriend. The cops were, he, uh, the cops were called. He was sleeping uh, about by the pool. Uh, the cops jumped over the fence in order to get to the house and went through the house. They found a gun of his wife's in the closet and they charged with constructive possession. And he fought it pro se or pro per, and they gave him 10 years. So the, the thing is that it, it puts a, a really bad possible liability to if you're ever around a situation where there's a gun that's not accounted for or locked up. So it's, 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 and it's, it's, it's a very, you know, you know, it, it can be a very challenging thing if you, you know, if you're in this situation, because they, they love, that's one of the things they love to prosecute people for. Well, hey, Tom, we've only, we've only got a couple of minutes. I got another guest waiting, but I have to point out one thing for you here is that I, I put it on Twitter today. Uh, the American government took my right to own a gun for a victimless crime rights. for having a gun. Exactly. For having a gun in a public place where they decided the Second Amendment doesn't apply. So I'm seceding to start my own country where rights can't be turned into privileges. And, well, and Tom, I, I'd like to. I'd like to make you an honorary citizen of Gardenia for now. We'll be formally declaring our independence next Independence Day by the American holiday, but we're going to make it a Gardenian holiday as well. So, Tom, okay. you know, it's, it's been great to, to have you, uh, you know, in, in my life as a friend and just as a fellow activist to know of and to be inspired by over all these years. Uh, if, if you could you know, wrap things up for us. What does, uh, what does America, what does the world, what does the Bitcoin community need to know uh, to take away from your story? And, and what can people do to connect with you? Well, uh, Morpheus2150 uh, at Gmail is my, is my email. And I, I do believe that as bad as things are, I, I do believe that humanity is on, you know, if you had to bet on something, I'm a gambler by nature, I, basically because I'm in sales. And so, of course, you have to be able to gamble with your time because basically I put my time out there with, no, with no, no guarantee that I'm going to make money. Just the fact that I have my wits, I'm going to be successful. And I believe that, that – or I, I, we know from, huma, from history that we're going to have – you know, the sun will come out tomorrow, you know, Humanity is going to move forward into the future. And even if, and, and because of this technology that we have with Bitcoin, it allows for the, for government and all of its processes to be stripped away. It, 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 we don't, people can see that we don't need these people to do what they're doing. And I believe that because of, of crypto, uh, we're going to have a, a we're going to improve the, 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 the quality of the world. And plus, people are getting more and more aware every day. I mean, I barely listen to music anymore. And I used to listen to rock and roll all the time. I'm listening to to, you know, things like uh, Joe Dispenza. I don't know if you've listened to him. Have you listened to mm -hmm. Joe Dispenza? No. You gotta watch, listen to Joe Dispenza. It's and 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 I I personally one of the things that I I used to meditate. I've been a meditator for twenty years, thirty years, uh, but now it's part of my life. I do it today. Before I got on this program, I spent thirty minutes doing my meditation, and I think that 
in order to, you know, this, this whole life thing is not about what's going on outside. It's about what's going on inside. And the only way to understand yourself that I, un, that I can found or understood or anything like that from the books that I've read and information that I've, is you have to, you want to go inside and block out what everything, all this other all this stuff that's going on outside because the only way that we can change the world is to become a better person. And I truly, I, I I'm grateful in, in, it's a bitter pill, a very bitter pill, but I am a better person by far because of this experience. And I made it a point to suck as much juice out of this, out of this experience to make it as positive as I can for my life. And no and matter every what, every day and every moment since, right, right, and that's important. It's very important to to do that because if we're not, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. You're either moving to the sale or away from the sale. Well, I want to use this experience to make my life a better, a, 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 have a better experience in this three dimensional thing that we have woken up in that. I didn't ask for this experience, but here I am. So might as well deal with it. You know, it's not what happens to you. It's how you deal with it. And we all, and, 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 and one thing that I learned is everybody suffers, expect it. This is the thing we're in birth, suffering, death, and rebirth. Even if your life is perfect, let's say your life is perfect. You have the perfect woman, you have millions of dollars. You got your children are beautiful. You're living in this garden of Eden eventually someone you love is going to die. And when they die, that's going to cause you suffering. Understand that this is part of the experience. It's not, oh my God, why did it happen to me? This is the reality of the situation. And by learning that and being cognizant of that, that this life is about suffering, how do I get out of that? And that's what Buddhism is all about is how to get out of this of this prison that they call samsara. Beautiful and Tom. I just I, I you know I, one sorry. one thing I I'd love to just mention to your audience is when I was in the federal detention center, I was there about 2 weeks. And I don't have the book with me right now or I'd show you the cover, but my girlfriend is reading it. But it's a book called it was it's a book called How to Transform Your Life. And I thought, oh, this is probably a Catholic Christian book. And then I read Gishi Gatso. Okay, I want to read this because I knew it wasn't a Christian person. And I started reading it, and he started talking about these concepts that I'm sharing with you in a much better format. And I defy, I, I will put this out. I defy anyone to read this book and not have it profoundly change your life, defy you. If you read it, your life will change as my life has changed. This is this is the new thing. The last couple of years, every time I meet Tom, and I'm like, all right, Tom, let's talk about Bitcoin. I'm like, oh yeah, everything is right in the universe. And I come away with that beautiful sense of spiritual peace and enlightenment, a bit of what you have cultivated for yourself. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Can I, I, one more I, I got to give you a joke. Can I give you a joke okay. before we go? Well, okay, I just so I want to remind people. Well, just one, one last thing I want to remind people. Thomas is really easy to get a hold of. He's a simple dude. It's Morpheus2150 at gmail.com. If you want to get involved with anything he's mentioned or just have any follow-up questions, highly recommend you email him. Morpheus2150 at gmail.com. And I love to talk. But here's the joke, okay? So this Buddhist monk, he goes to New York City, and he's in his robes, and he sees a hot dog vendor. And he goes up to the hot dog vendor, and the vendor says, well, what would you like on your, on your hot dog? He goes, oh, make me one with everything. And so the vendor slaps on the sauerkraut and the mustard and the onions and the pickles and the reddish. And, and the, the monk hands him a $50 bill. And so the monk starts eating the, the hot dog and he's going, hey, I gave you a $50 bill. And the, the hot dog vendor says, oh, all change comes from within. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tom.
<laughs> well, it's great to hear you, Adam. It's great to see you. Keep on rocking uh, the free world, buddy. You. Yeah, absolutely. Hope to see you in Gardena.